Okay, so hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Fall Global. This is where we connect with global first entrepreneurs, remote work experts, and talent acquisition experts from all around the world. Our guest today is Teller Roa, a director of talent and culture at Vista. Teller, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Vit. Happy to be here. It's great to have you on the show. And before we dive into our main discussion, I guess, could you share with us, uh, with our listeners, a bit about your background. Maybe you can talk, tell us about how this doc in Hawaii got you into recruiting, yeah? <laughs> yeah, it's a great story. I, so I actually, I went to University of Hawaii to study hospitality. Um, and, and right after graduating, um, on my favorite beach, a golden retriever puppy ran up to me and I started talking up uh, with his parents. And I offered them a beer and, and they thought, you know, you'd make a great recruiter. They worked at a company called Tech Systems, which is a national company. Folks probably have heard of them. Um, and that's not a career I had thought of, honestly. Like I, I obviously I studied hospitality. I lived in Hawaii. Um, they brought me in for an interview and I learned that what I love about hospitality was the people element of it. And actually recruiting is an even more people centric job in many ways. Uh, so it was a great, great fit. I had a, you know, a great uh, training and education, if you will, at tech systems and, and tech recruiting. And that kicked this career off uh, for me that I haven't looked back. It's It's been a really great journey. So I, I moved to Boston a few years into my career where there's a great startup ecosystem and, and made my way in in-house recruiting, building and scaling talent teams. And that's where I've been since. So Cool. Uh, let's talk then about your current company, Vista, right? A video marketing company that is based in Boston. And what I know about the company that it has a really unique and cool company culture, right? So can you tell us more about the company itself and like uh, tell us what makes uh, Vista, Vista's culture so specific? Yeah, Wistia is unique in so many ways. Um, we've actually been around for about 17 years. And so even though we feel like a startup, uh, you know, we've been profitable for six years. We've been around for a long time. We're not a startup by many definitions of it, uh, but we've stayed really lean as a team. Today, we're only about 180 employees. What makes us the most unique is that Chris and Brendan, our co-founders, bought the company back from investors uh, about six or so years ago. Uh, and that means we've been able to be really intentional about how we're growing the business. Um, we're very happy with uh, taking a long-term view of our growth. And that means that 20 to 30% growth year over year is, is a success to us. It also means we're able to invest in our team and in our people a lot more than many other companies our size. Um, and lastly, it means we get to be contrarian because we don't have investors like pressuring us to do what everyone else is doing. And that's served us really well through the past few years, especially when uh, you know a lot of companies slammed the brakes and did layoffs at the start of the pandemic. We were able to kind of wait and see and, and learned pretty quickly that actually it was a unique opportunity for a video company like us. Um, so it's been, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of advantages that, that come with that. And I think it's also been really appealing to candidates that come from that fast growth environment uh, to be able to come in and slow down and, and think a little bit longer term for a change at Wistia. That's uh, that's a very interesting story when like the, your, your co-founders in fact bought the company back, uh, choosing profitability over rapid growth, I guess. That's, that was the main decision behind that. So uh, how has this decision influenced the way Wistia builds teams and approaches talent acquisition? Uh, well, for one, we tend to move a lot slower in growing headcount. Um, you know, it, it's important to us to stay profitable uh, as we grow. And so we're not a company that's spending more than we're making for, uh, you know, breakout growth. Um, as I mentioned, it also means we can invest a lot more in our people. So we've had, you know, we've offered amazing benefits. Um, we offered 16 weeks of parental leave for all parents um, before that began to be to be more common um but but really you know i think talent density has been another primary focus for us because of this unique structure and that's because when you have to stay lean as a team 
who is on that team is so much more important. Uh, right. So um, the, the other thing is when a company's not doubling in size year over year and your headcount's not growing rapidly, sometimes it can feel like there's less opportunity for growth for certain folks. Um, but I think we've done really well to empower folks for lateral moves. And, and we've had a lot of movement internally in some really cool ways um, over the years. So Wistia has a large amount of folks who've been here five to 10 years. For a company like ours, it's pretty rare in tech. I think two years is the average tenure. Um, but I think that speaks to the culture we've built and the reasons to stay. Speaking about this talent density, right? So uh, how does Vista define and measure talent density? Yeah, it's. Uh, I'll be honest, it's a hard thing to measure. When I talk about talent density, it's more about like, what is our priority? And I, when I think about um, HR as a field in general, I think you, I think the traditional priorities still prevail at most companies. And that I'll give you an example. Um, you know, most HR teams exist to mitigate risk and save money. Uh, these are the things that companies ask of their HR team, whether they publish that or not, right? But that translates to be cheap and make rules. Uh, and you can see how these things actually like uh, contradict a pursuit of talent density in a company because you need to be intentional about who you're bringing in. And so when I talk about talent density, it's what is the priority? When talent density is your priority, uh, then you might take your compensation strategy a little bit more seriously and you might be okay with paying more competitively. You might not care as much about time to fill when you're measuring your recruiter success, right? You might care more about who's actually uh, stepping into that role. So uh, that's what it means for me. Um, you know, all of your metrics should really tie into that priority. And so when I'm working with my recruiters, uh, you know, some folks might be surprised coming onto the team that like we're not racing to fill a role. And I actually like to see when my recruiters are pushing back, if a hiring manager wants to hire somebody who we think we could do better. Um, and so a recruiter here should be actually talking managers out of making a hire quite often because we can do better often, right? Um, so it's not necessarily a number I can put on a chart for you saying we're this talent dense today, right? But when it's your priority, you, you look at performance management differently. You look at team building and hiring differently. Um, it all feeds into that longer term thinking as well. You know, the, the strength of our team is like a ball of clay that we're molding over time and there's no finish line. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, we, we can be a little more intentional and a little more, more patient, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, super focused on the, the caliber of the teams that we're building here. Yeah. And uh, one of your philosophies is that the founder is the first recruiter. Yeah. So it, yeah. I, I completely agree with this statement. As a co founder myself, I believe that my primary job is to find the right people for the company. Right. And I know right. the majority of my uh, startup clients, uh, they, they include this as a final step. They, they always have this meeting with CEO to assess cultural fit and stuff like that. And yeah. I believe that it is essential for a CEO of the companies who are just maybe uh, up to 100 employees to have this this step there. So what what, yeah. what, what, is, your, what is your vision on this? Uh, how can startup founders uh, who, who are already, who are already you know, juggling tons of tasks can play this direct role in hiring to truly shape their, their teams. Totally. Uh, and this is one of the core tenets of, of my approach, especially for startups. Uh, you know, a company is a group of people at a point in time. And so how successful your company is two years from now depends entirely on, on who your team is a year from now. Right. And that's just, that just makes sense when we hear that. Right. I think it's easy for founders to get, caught up and think that this is like an administrative cost center task that uh, that they don't have time for and lose sight of the fact that the, the team that they are building is just as important as when they were bringing the first three people to help them build their idea at the start, right? So it's a great idea to your point to have 
uh, a final conversation uh, at, as long as you can, at least up to 100 people. But um, it, I, I go even further than that. I think that a founder should have a close relationship with their recruiter, and actually they should bring a seasoned recruiter on sooner than, than most founders think. I say that because hiring is a skill that you need to develop and hone, and, and everyone is, is at a different point in building that skill. And so you may be bringing on super smart engineers, product leaders, um, but you're still going to find variance in how effective they are at hiring and keeping the bar for talent really high, right? So I always say, if, if you plan to make 10 hires this year, it's time for you to bring on an in-house recruiter um, who's, who's pretty seasoned because they're bringing on this subject matter expertise that's invaluable to your team. If you, if you scale like most companies do, and you say, it's up to my department heads to keep the bar for talent high and, and focus on hiring. Uh, it will be very hard for you to measure success because they're also measuring the success of the teams that they're building. Uh, and you'll end up growing in tumors because some teams will be really good at hiring. Some teams will be not so good. There will be a very inconsistent process that doesn't allow you to kind of do postmortem and, and you know, assess the issues when a hire goes wrong. Whereas if you have a, a recruiter who's done this before and can build a smart, intentional function that's consistent across the business uh, and also hold your interviewers to a high standard for quality assessments and, and, you know, collecting the right data points, suddenly you have this intelligence into how your team is growing. And the founder can, at any point, look into that and be a part of it. If they're just taking the last session, then they're a bit of a gatekeeper, which can be helpful, but that also depends a lot on their ability to keep a bar high as well, right? You see some founders that are really good at this. Other founders may be more of like the salesman who gets people excited and gets them across the line, and that's helpful too. Um, but really a, a centralized, uh, strong talent function is invaluable in giving you all this insight, measurability, and scalability uh, consistently across all your teams. So many people think that a recruiter just here to look at resumes and bring in candidates and they're missing so much value in that approach. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, I, I often invite, uh, I often invite my, my, uh, clients, so founders, executives, uh, to join my podcast. And this approach has this incredible effect in terms of attracting top, top candidates, you know, just 20 minutes uh, of your time can transform it into a much better pipeline of candidates who not only believe in you after this episode, but also gain a deeper understanding of your company's culture. And, and th th this makes, you know, them feel more, I guess, connected to your vision. And that's one yeah. of those uh, steps that uh, CEO and founders uh, basically can do at this initial uh, uh, stages of this of hiring, right? So maybe okay. maybe you can also tell tell us some more practical things. Uh, what what specific actions can founders, CEOs, um, executives can can take to help attract you know the best candidates? Yeah, I think um, that's that is a great bit of advice to get out there and actually do some messaging, right? Uh, recruiters can do that pretty well, but to your point, for those senior leadership roles or, or, or like really critical um, IC hires, it is worth your time to get out there to attract the brightest people because they're more likely to respond to you. Um, I think another great bit of advice is to uh, get out and talk about the culture you're building. I think uh, it's, it's easy to forget that you are building something in your culture. You know, it, obviously you're building a product, but in building a company, you need to be intentional about the culture and the teams that you're building. And so the best companies I think have founders that almost approach that the same way they approach building a product. They're iterative, um, you know, intentional, strategic, they measure successes, but um, they, they get out and, and talk about what they're building, what makes them different, what makes them stand out. Um, you know, founders have so much to focus on. It's really hard to fit this type of thing. And sometimes it can feel like fluff, uh, but it makes a big difference. Um, you know, you want to attract people who believe in the, the, what you're building, not only the product, but the company and the team and the culture, 
because then they'll come in and help you drive that. If you talk about what you want to build, you'll attract people that want to build that, right? Um, so that's that's another thing. And, and like I said, just viewing the culture and the teams that you're building in the same way that you would view building a product. One mm -hmm. example of this is, I think companies should, you know, companies do a customer persona exercise often for go-to-market strategy. Who are we selling yeah. to and how do they think? I think that companies should do a, a top talent persona exercise mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, who do we want to work here? Mm -hmm. Because that helps you frame you. Obviously, you want your culture to be fun and engaging, but not just for anyone. Right. You want it to specifically be fun and engaging for excellent people. Mm -hmm. And that often requires you to focus more on like the experience of work rather than the snacks or the ping pong table because the best talent cares more about what they're building and who they're working with That's than they true. do about those frills. That's so true. doing a top talent persona exercise is incredibly helpful in like framing how you build your, your culture. Yeah, yeah. And speaking about uh, quality, right? So you, you often talk about this, uh, about the value of prioritizing quality over quantity in recruiting, right? And yeah. this approach has become I don't know, like uh, even more relevant in the current market situation, I guess. So it, it is not so hard to get tons of applicants right now. In fact, a simple LinkedIn post can bring thousands of applicants to you. Mm -hmm. However, the real question is what the quality of those applicants, right? Yeah. Uh, so my question is, how do you balance the need of for this efficiency, right, with the goal of providing this more personalized, more human-centric experience to candidates, uh, and just just overall to this process of recruitment. Recruit. Yeah, I I love this question because um, it it may seem on the surface like these things are mutually exclu exclusive, right? You're trading one for the other, um, but I I believe that they're actually not mutually exclusive and, and one actually feeds the other. So I'll explain. Um, it's another reason, by the way, to hire a seasoned recruiter sooner than you think. Uh, in, in talking about like human centric recruiting versus efficiency, think about the way most companies hire, um, especially early on when they don't know better. Um, you might pay a ton of money for a number of job boards to juice up your stack of resumes, right? because inbound seems more efficient. But what happens is always true, 95% of those resumes are not a fit. And then you have to pay somebody to come in and look at those resumes. So you're you're paying $2,000 a month or year, however, whatever job board you're doing to bring in resumes, and then you're paying somebody to look at bad resumes. And that is wildly inefficient, but that's still how most people view a recruiting function today, right? I don't care much at all about inbound. Um, and that's because not only is it not efficient, but it's way less personal too. Like you could get a thousand people applying and most of them are not gonna get a personal email back anyways. So it's not human, it's not efficient. What I wanna do is bring in a seasoned recruiter who's worked in staffing before. They know how to go out and proactively find the people who aren't even looking for a job because they're so good that the company they're at wants to keep them so bad. They're treated really well, right? Those people aren't applying to your jobs. I want my recruiter to spend 90% of their time messaging those people because then I know every person they're messaging is a likely fit for the role. Every person they're getting on the phone is a high caliber, high quality person, right? They're also having like personalized messages, like human conversations with these candidates and they have more of a chance of bringing the right people in. So that's what I mean by this is more efficient and it's more human. They're not mutually exclusive. And that's very much been our approach here at Wistia. We not only uh, don't spend much on job boards, um, but actually in the past two years, we haven't made a single agency hire outside of a, a VP hire role we made this year, which a company our size that saves half a million to a million a year, you know, agencies will charge 30% per hire. And if you're hiring seasoned engineers, that gets expensive really fast, right? Um, so we, we currently just have, uh, we had more recruiters last year when we were hiring a lot more, but we currently have two recruiters who do an outstanding job with proactive outbound search. And more than half of the hires that we make are found by my recruiters. They're usually folks who weren't even applying or searching. 
Yeah, you know, it, it's funny that some companies nowadays think that they don't need recruiters after getting like a tons of applicants, right? Mm -hmm. But but then they they you know come back to us, you know, stressed and like needing help to uh, uh, to find those perfect candidates for them because they yeah. they they waste tons of time, you know, checking those irrelevant resumes again and again and in. In fact, it doesn't make sense. Okay, so, yeah. another question. Uh, we stay initially in person, um, an in person company, right? So then yeah. transitioned to remote work during this pandemic. Um, and I'm curious about your perspective on global hiring, like as a next step. Do you yeah. see it uh, as a potential next step for your company? Uh, if not, what's holding you back? Yeah, great question. Um, I'll start with the first part. Um, we were mostly in person before the pandemic. I think we only had about six people out of state remotely. They were mostly engineers. Um, and almost everyone came into the office at least three days a week in those days. Uh, we had a very like quirky, um, creative and exciting culture in our office in Cambridge. And I think what really stood out is we had really incredible relationships between our employees and across teams of all kinds. Uh, so we were really nervous about what it meant to go fully remote. And actually, like a lot of companies at the start of the pandemic, we thought it would be two weeks. And then we thought, okay, maybe two months. And then we thought, all right, we're, we're probably going to be fully remote for a whole year, right? But we were pleasantly surprised at, at first. What we found was that in some ways we were actually more productive because there was so much like, I mean, obviously you save on commuting time, right? But you're not like physically walking between uh, meeting rooms. Uh, people can be way more uh, strategic about how they use their time. And that work-life integration is suddenly way easier. Um, but we found that we were actually producing faster at first. And in time, I think we've learned that the, the key ingredient that remained at first was the quality of relationships. Those were so strong and so deep that people had this like trust and uh, you know, they knew how each other communicated, they knew how each other worked. In over time though, that begins to like dissipate because suddenly, I, now at this point, I think 85% of our company started since the pandemic, right? So the, the amount and, and strength and quality of those relationships really diminished. And that began to introduce some new challenges, right? Um, trust is a lot harder. Uh, it's a lot harder for somebody new to understand and integrate in the ways that we work and actually connect with people. Um, and so as soon as we could, we started getting people together in person again. And so... We've been doing a couple meetings a year. We, I think we did two all hands meetings last year. One was our first offsite. We went to, actually that was this year. We went to Austin, Texas. Um, and, and we've learned that those are just invaluable. You, you cannot replace time together in person to build relationships and work just feels so much better when you know the tone someone's slacking with you, you with and, and you're not assuming a tone that they're using, uh, for example. So I think we found a great balance now of like, we still have our office space. A number of people still use it weekly, but for the most part, we are optimized for remote meetings. We do most of our work remotely, but we make a point to get together and have some fun in person to facilitate that connection and those relationships. In terms of global hiring, it's not something on our radar today, just because we are so different as a company. Um, and at our size, there's plenty of talent here in the States for us to go after. Um, but I wouldn't say it's a next step for us, but maybe a step after the next step. We are very focused on expanding uh, our customer count and, and new customer acquisition. And uh, one of those levers will be at some point in the near to midterm future, uh, you know, looking for more customers internationally. And I think once we start investing in that seriously and see some success in that kind of growth, it'll probably make sense for us to build a customer team first in a different uh, time zone. Um, so that would probably be a first step. Another thing we are currently considering is, um, you know, 
compliance and, and quality control in, in terms of like what kinds of videos our customers are uploading. We have standards and rules that, you know, obviously you can't upload certain inappropriate things into our platform, right? Monitoring that is a huge task. Um, and it's becoming harder for us to do that internally as we grow. So this may be another uh, reason why we look offshore for um, a specific team for, you know, a specific function. Okay. So you're planning to outsource this specific activity. Yeah, we, we are, cons we are con starting to consider it that. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So, and probably my last question, looking at the big picture, right? So how do you see the future work hiring and maybe recruiting in 2024? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's going to be really fun to watch it play out, right? It's, it's been a wild roller coaster. I was talking about um, the past three years in terms of phases of the pandemic for a while, um, because I think it was really interesting, like how short the time horizons were between shifts and mindsets. I mean, we saw it just last year, right? Talent teams and recruiters going from like number one MVP at a growing company to either being laid off or like almost forgotten, right? 180. Um, and I saw that very clearly in like phases of the pandemic talent market. But now I'm sort of, I think we're seeing some normalization with some key things remaining, but I don't think it's going to be consistent for everyone. And I think the way it will play out is some companies will like lean into in-person again. Uh, we already see that, especially larger companies, they want people together. I think a lot of those companies are doing it because they think it's important for performance. Um, and I think that that's flawed thinking. Uh, I think in-person work is only good for connection. And actually the benefit of the world we live in is the element of choice. When people can choose how they work and operate, they're always going to be more engaged, happier, and more productive because they know how they work better than I do. Uh, and that's what we want, right? Uh, I, you also have to believe that people want to do good work to have that philosophy. And I believe that the kind of person we want to hire wants to do good work, right? So if we're hiring the right people, then that part should come naturally. Um, but I think for companies like us, it'll be a competitive advantage. Um, so I think it's just another thing that ideally smaller startups will have over larger enterprises to attract talent, uh, that flexibility and that element of choice. Um, and, and beyond that, I, I don't see, you know, some folks were predicting that salaries would tank at the start of this year. And I, I never really saw that as the case. If anything, maybe the floor of bands would go down. Mm -hmm. But my view has been all year that top talent knows their worth. And also That's companies true. are still hanging on to that top talent. So you can't win top talent from a great company by paying them less. It just doesn't work out that way, right? So I, I never really saw the ceiling of our comp bands decreasing, and we actually haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. um, so it will, and also, by the way, you know, tech journalists are so flippant, you know, week by week, they could say opposite things. But at the start of this year, they saw layoffs, and they were talking about like the job market flipping, and it never actually did. We still have more openings than candidates at every point this year. Mm -hmm. So it was still competitive. It was just a little bit less competitive. Um, and nobody, none of those tech journalists really like talked about that or, or reassessed, at least none that I saw. But um, I think it's important to kind of look through the buzz and talk mm -hmm. to people on the ground before you make an assessment of, you know, what's coming next. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Thank you for your valuable insights on this importance of talent density, right? Balancing speed and personal touch and hiring this, the role of founders in recruiting. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, thanks for your time. Yeah, my pleasure. It was a fun chat. Um, and again, thanks for having me here. See you soon.